Uryu, Chad, and Ganju would all awaken inside of the medical holding cell of the Serite, homed by the Squad 4 Serving Corps. There, they would have their wounds attended to, but much to Uryu's surprise, they wouldn't be executed immediately. As he had awoken, Chad would fill him in on what was going on. For Uryu, he felt that he was already as useless as he could be, seeing as how he had used up all of his spiritual energy and sacrificed his Quincy powers all in the hopes of defeating Mayuri, the squad captain of Squad 12, and the one responsible for his master's death. From what he had learned from Chad, a captain had been killed not too long ago, an investigation was being held. Of course, because they were the invading Ryoka, it was only natural that they would keep them alive for future interrogating purposes. Although, this did leave them to wondering where the others were. That was Lois, Clark, Ichigo, Orihime. Orihime, of all of them, was actually sitting with the captain of Squad 11, Kenpachi Zaraki who was still recovering from his fight with both Ichigo and Clark. Amazed by their power and potential, he wanted to know more about these Ryoka, and the girl seemed to be the most pleasant. And even more so, she was able to wield one of those lantern rings. Kenpachi had tried recruiting some lanterns after they had died, but usually they preferred not to get involved with the Soul Reapers or with the Soul Society in general, and that was understandable after a lifetime of servitude and usually when a lantern died, they didn't die in the most graceful of circumstances. Sure, there were the ones that grew old and retired, yes, but normally you had lanterns that died in a tragic accident or a terrible fight, final stand. So it wasn't uncommon for when their souls came through to the Soul Society that a few lanterns would be recruited into the the Soul Reaper Corps. After all, you came from one institute of a hero-like association that established law and order, and the Soul Reapers felt that they were in the same boat. But very few did Green Lanterns ever take on an assignment. Most just preferred to live their life in the afterlife in a more peaceful and less violent sort of way. But to come across someone with the lantern ring and with her capabilities, especially from what he had learned in her fight against Mayuri, he was definitely intrigued and was looking to help them. In the meantime, Ichigo and Clark would be training under Yoroichi. The boys had just three days to learn and master their Bankai, a technique that would take the average Soul Reaper years to accomplish. And not just in the double digits, sometimes even the triple digits. But, given the plight of their circumstance, three days was all that they had. Meanwhile, Renji would also be training up with his Bankai as well. He wanted to help save Rukia. He knew he had to. And he knew he'd have to become as strong as he possibly could... Because one way or another, the only way to get to Rukia would be to get through the strongest of the Gote 13. And Byakuya would be among them. Of course, there was also a fourth member of their training party, Lois Lane. Of course, Yoruichi took a special interest in Lois, especially seeing that little spectacle she pulled off. Yorichi would inquire more about Lois than before. Of course, she knew very much about the H-dial that was in her possession. But she wanted to know more about Lois's past. How something of that magnitude would even fall under her in the first place. As Lois would explain, her family was Japanese on her father's side. While her father, at his younger years would move to the United States and would soon settle down in Metropolis where he would later meet Lois's mom. 
Her grandparents stayed in their home country of Japan, and Lois had decided to stay there as a foreign exchange student living in Kurakura Town. Of course, it wasn't just to go to school, but it was also to help her grandmother in caring for her grandfather, a man who was suffering from the early stages of dementia and couldn't remember most of his past. She had always remembered playing with her grandfather when she was younger, and she would always tell these fantastical stories, things that she always believed were made up. Her grandfather always used to say that in his younger years, he secretly served as a superhero all around the world, and that the item that he had called the H-Dial allowed him to transform and tap into different powers from worlds far away, different dimensions or universes. Of course, Lois had never truly believed that to be possible, but the stories always stuck with her. They always resonated in her heart. So you can imagine that shortly after, with Ichigo undergoing his Soul Reaper transformation, then Clark discovering that he had his alien origins as well, the rising of Hollows and Soul Reapers and Uryu as a Quincy and Orihime gaining her abilities and Chad as well and Rukia and all this crazy stuff that she was a part with, it started to resonate with her spirit as well. For some reason, those stories, they continued to stir within her heart. And she took another trip to that old attic, finding the H-Dial. She wondered if it were really true, if it were really possible. She remembered holding on to it, and when she brought it for training, she transformed. And for a temporary amount of time, she gained the power of a hero. From there, Yoroichi would help her learn to control her Ryatsu, believing that the combination of these hero transformations, along with the usage of her spiritual energy, it could bring a whole new well of power. And for Lois, she wanted to support her friends any way that she could. As such, Yoroichi would take a vested interest in training Lois, believing that she could have great potential in the future. In the meantime, there was much stress and high tension within the Soul Society. Following the murder of Sosuke Aizen, the captain of Squad 5, an internal investigation was taking place. On top of all of that, you also had the future execution of Rukia, and you had the attack of the Ryoka. All of this happening all at once. Safe to say, everyone was on edge. No one was trusting of the other. Everyone suspicious of what was happening. Even John Jones, the squad captain of Squad 99, was here. And he never showed up to the Serate. At least, it was so rare that you could hardly remember the last time he was ever there to begin with. All of this couldn't be a coincidence. And for Captain Hitsugaya, he knew this especially to be true. Of course, he had his sights on Gein. Gin Ichimaru, but the sly captain always seemed to be where the evidence wasn't, but that Cheshire cat-like grin on his face, always appearing to be so oblivious to everything around him, a wolf in sheep's clothing, a snake hidden in the garden, that was who Gin was, and at this point, it almost felt like he wasn't even trying to hide it anymore. The way that he acted so benevolent to everything that was going on around him. It was enough to drive Toshinori insane. It was as if the man had no guilt at all. Even if no one could fly out say he was the murderer or that he was the one conspiring with all of these shenanigans... He didn't really do a good job of trying to dissuade any of these notions against him. In fact, he seemed to just be playing into the chaos. One way or another, the truth would be revealed. And when it was all said and done, 
where would the battle lines be drawn? For Ichigo and for Clark, respectively, as they continued their training and to hone their Bankai, they learned that their situation was unique to most others. As Yoroichi would explain, a Zanpakuto had multiple stages. The first form, the Shikai. As noted, most Soul Reapers carried around what appeared to be a standard sword, nothing too overly special. But when they transformed, that's when they entered into their Shikai-like state. But for Ichigo and for Clark, they were in a different circumstance. For one, Ichigo Zanpato was always in his Shikai form, the large blade that he carried on his back. And for Clark, he was effectively now a living Shikai, seeing as how his body was no longer an ordinary body. Through some unknown means, Ichigo and Clark, their power did not resonate like all of the others. Ichigo's Bankai was only one step away because he was already in Shikai form of his Zanpakuto. Clark's body was a living Zanpakuto that his spirit inhabited, effectively making him a Zanpakuto and a Shikai all in one. That only left them to reach the second and the final stage, the Bankai itself. As for Renji, he continued in his own training of Bankai. Everyone was working ex Impressively hard as they knew that the final confrontation was set to take place. The few captains that were remaining to be seen, they were as powerful as powerful could be. There was no easy way of putting it. One way or another, conflict wasn't going to be avoided. If they were going to get the Rukia, they were going to have to go through these captains. And even with Yoroichi assisting them, and with unexpected help on the way, there was still this gut-wrenching feeling of wondering if it would be enough. Eventually, the third day would finally come. Ichigo and Clark were still training. They hadn't reached that level yet, and Renji had decided to go on ahead. Lois offered to accompany him, but... He denied the request. Ichigo would tell Renji not to die, and Clark would echo those same sentiments. But Renji just encouraged them to achieve Bankai as soon as possible. He was going to cut them off at the pass. For Renji, he had known Rukia for a long time. And safe to say, their friendship was far deeper than most. In truth, Renji honestly had never thought that things could have gotten this far. Even for what Rukia had done, he thought that at the very least they would have shown some leniency. That this whole situation could have been something like water under the bridge. But now it spiraled into such a mess. For so long he thought he could ignore it. That if he just tuned out all of those voices of doubt in his mind and just allowed for the situation to play itself out that he could eventually let go. But for Renji, that was never going to happen. And so, on the day of Rukia's execution, Renji found himself moving to confront Byakuya, knowing that he would stand in his way. He gave it his all, and he tried as best as he could, but ultimately it was not enough. John Jones had accompanied them, but he did not get involved. It wasn't his place to, as Byakuya would deal with his lieutenant. Renji would unleash the full might of his Zanpakuto, his Bankai Zabimaru. Its fangs fierce and sharp, but in the end, they could only faintly pierce the captain. Renji was struck down. As Byakuya returned his blade back to its sheath, 
he turned to the captain who was accompanying him to the execution. I'm sorry that you had to see that. No, I understand. When it comes to passion, feelings can often get in the way of logic. That is true. I must say I am surprised to see you here after all this time. You normally don't prefer to be at these sorts of things. The situation was urgent. I could not ignore it. You mean the Kryptonian? He is no different than the other Ryoka. He would have been dealt with. There was no need for you to get involved. When it comes to matters beyond the realm of Earth, I must be involved. Krypton is my jurisdiction, even if it no longer exists. For a Kryptonian to enter into the Serite, it reflects my inadequacy. Do you still hold on to the past, Jean? To the past? I use it as a teacher, the lessons that guide me. What happened to her wasn't your fault, Biakia would say. You still hold hatred for them, don't you? Hatred? I have chosen to let go. But the pain, I cannot. Even if I can let go of the hate, I can never give my forgiveness. I don't hate Kryptonians, but I will never forgive what they have done to me, what they took from me. This Kryptonian Ryoka, whoever he is, I will not make the same mistake twice. If he falls, Byakuya, he will fall at my blade. Today, the remaining members available of the Gote 13, captains and lieutenants would gather together. The execution being overseen by Captain Yamamoto as Rukia Akuchki would be brought out to the pillars for where she would face her final judgment. Today marked the end of Rukia, the day of execution was upon her. This concludes Bleach Legacy, What If Superman Was in Bleach, Season 2, Part 7. As always, if you enjoyed today's video and everything else that we have to offer, then please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit that bell for post notifications so you can stay up to date on everything that is Power Core Productions and Podcastings. That's to come out now and in the future. And stay tuned tomorrow as we continue with Bleach Legacy. What if Superman was in Bleach? Season 2, Part 8. But anyway, that's going to do it for the end of today's video. I'm Javon Harrington with Power Core Productions and Podcastings. Signing off, and I'll see you next time.